Hey everybody, welcome back. So today is episode three in our species spotlight on reticulated pythons. And today we're gonna to be talking about feeding. Uh, we're gonna go over some of the types of prey items that uh, you may start your hatchlings on, uh, some of the prey items that your snakes are gonna move into as they're bigger, and we're gonna do a feeding with our bigger snakes today, as well as a couple other things we're gonna hit on. So you wanna go anywhere, that's what we're talking about today, is feeding our reticulated pythons on intrepid exotics. Whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. Okay guys, so since we're talking about feeding, I kind of wanted to get one point out of the way really quick. Some of you may get mad, turn it off, so be it. But um, I, I do need to make the point that I don't do any live feeding at all. It's all frozen thawed or freshly, freshly killed, um, freshly humanely euthanized. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons for that, uh, not least of which being the main priority that I have when it comes to animals is that it's ethical and humane for all the animals that are involved. That's kind of my first checkbox on anything that I'm deciding when I'm talking about my animals. I'm not gonna go into my big spiel here. There's a 45 minute video right here that you guys can check out if you really wanna see the details that I go into on it. But there's no reason to do live feeding, um, particularly on your larger animals. So you'll never see me doing that. It's all frozen thawed or freshly killed. So Feeding reticulated pythons is typically pretty easy. Now we're gonna have times when they go off food. We're gonna have times when hatchlings may be a little bit slow to start, but as a general rule, retics are known for their food response. Uh, that's why we put so much effort into talking with folks about tap training and reading behaviors and knowing when that food response is turned off because they're typically really voracious eaters. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have any of them out with me right now is because I've been thawing rabbits and drying them over there and the last thing I want to do right now is handle any snakes after I've been handling their prey. And that's the first point I'm going to make with any of your snakes. Uh, no matter how well trained your snake is, uh, no matter how easy they are to manage, um, but if you're handling their prey items and they pick up the scent of that prey, then that increases the likelihood that you'll end up getting hit. So when it's feeding day and you're working with their prey and you're working with meals for them, uh, don't handle your snakes. You know, that's, that's kind of a, a good rule of thumb. And um, it's another reason why we don't move our snakes out of their enclosure to feed them. Um, kind of a myth that we've, hear, we've heard kind of bounced back and forth here over the years. Uh, people talking about having a feeding enclosure or a feeding bin where they take the snake out and feed them and put them back in. Definitely de don't do that. There, there's no reason to do that at all. Um, the, the, the part, I think one of the biggest issues with that is that we talk about handling our snakes, going in, turning off their food response in order to handle them. Now, if, you're, if your snake's in the enclosure and you're getting ready to feed them, You've got to turn off their food response, move them into a bin, and then you reactivate their food response with the prey item. And if you've got a snake that's been hesitant or been refusing or something, that, that may make it harder for them to actually start eating. Um, so anyway, you get them in there, you feed them. And my male retake used to be really bad for this. Uh, after he ate, his food response was on fire for three or four days after that. And he just wanted to eat anything that moved. Um, so that being said, if you've got them in a bin, you feed them, you go to move them again, you can have your hands full. If that snake's still got a really hot food response, um, now you've got to shut them back down. When it's intensified, get them back into their enclosure. It confuses them. It, it makes them... Um, a little bit more susceptible to making mistakes I think um, and, and it's just wholly unnecessary especially if you've got a big collection if you've got 10 20 30 100 snakes there's no way you're moving them into a different enclosure and then feed them. you'll get bit three times a day <laughs> so so squash that right off the bat we, we don't move our snakes to feed them. 
if you're just buying a snake, say for instance you go on Morph Market and you get a hatchling retic. Um, if the seller is a responsible seller, they're going to do a couple things. Um, one, when that snake hatches, they're going to give it time to have its first shed and typically get three consecutive unproblematic meals down, uh, at least. That's what a good breeder should do. Uh, you're not going to get, you shouldn't get, any snakes that have hatched, been cleaned off, and a couple days or a week later put off and shipped to you, or you shouldn't be picking them up that soon after they've hatched. Uh, if you're, like I said, if you're getting a hatchling, you should, it, it should at least be one to two months after that animal's hatched. Um, to where it's had that couple weeks to get its first shed in and then had time to get at least three consecutive meals one two three back to back so that we know that they're eating good and then you can move them off and rehome them now when you get a hatchling you know it's going to get there uh, typically people won't ship them with a full stomach so you know the snake will eat they'll wait for that animal to excrete um, and then go ahead and ship them so when you get them should be pretty close to their feeding time. Um, that being said, you, you, you want to kind of be careful with that because hatchling snakes, the, the stress of shipping, the stress of moving into a new environment, uh, the stress of, you know, all that whole experience right there uh, can be tough on them and it can interrupt their food cycle. They can be so stressed out that they don't want to eat. So, you know, you're, you're probably, by the time you get that animal, maybe a week, away from his last meal it's perfectly fine to give that animal another week okay um retics although they're voracious eaters they can go you know a week or two in between meals certainly not going to hurt them um and it may actually be a lot better for them you know if you get them in if they're really stressed out they may eat and then the first time you go into their enclosure or something if they're really stressed out they may regurge that meal or something and then you've got a bigger problem on your hands so when you get it just give it a few days, give it a week, uh, before you try feeding them. Now there's going to be exceptions to every rule. You may pull that snake right out of the bag and he's just got long, slow tongue flicks and he's checking stuff out and he's just happy to be out of the bag. Um, you're going to see that sometimes too. Sometimes these animals have just got such a good disposition that they're going to come out of the bag and say, okay man, here we are. You know, so you can kind of use your own judgment on that. Uh, but like I said, rule of thumb. As a general rule, give them a few days to a week to kind of acclimate before you try feeding them. And then when you do, you know, you're probably going to be feeding something, you know, chicks, uh, mice, small rats, things of that nature. And it's real easy. Leave them out overnight. Uh, you put them in warm water to get your body temperature up. And once you do that, set them off on a towel dry them off you don't really want to send them in there soaking wet uh, just dry them off feed them body temperature should be between 90 and 100 degrees on that prey item um, so they'll pick up the heat and just be careful too so i'm going to show you the tools that i use for feeding you know you can see these long tongs right here i've got a pair of hemostats that i use on some of them these are really nice because they'll click closed on you like that the only problem is is you got to kind of get coordinated enough to get it to release so that the prey animal tail doesn't get stuck in there and a the snake ends up wrapping around your hemostats and if you don't have any of those things and you happen to have something like this off the barbecue these work just fine too um the wife the mother um <laughs> make sure you don't let them know that you're doing this just take them use them Buy some new ones for the kitchen. I don't think they'd really appreciate you plucking rats with them. But uh, And then when you get into your larger snakes, this is what I use. It's just two foot grabbers. These things right here are, you get them from Midwest Tongs, and these things are super strong. Um, I've had eight pound rabbits in here before. You just clamp down on it as hard as you can. You know, it's a little tough to hold it out there. But, um, but yeah, these things are really sturdy and they're really good. So you definitely want to use tools. You don't want to be going in there, hanging it by the tail and so forth. Just about every time I've tried hand feeding one of my snakes like that, 
they've missed. They get confused. They pick up the stronger heat signature off my hand, the lower, the weaker heat signature off the prey item, and end up shooting towards my hand. So don't do that. Use a tool of some sort. Now if you're having a hatchling that you're having difficulty getting to eat, there's a couple tricks you can use. Um, one of them that I've used on my uh, little uh, Burmese in there. Like I said, it took me a long time to get her eaten on her own. And what I ultimately had to do is I got a black container with a lid on it. I put her in there. I put the prey item in there. I closed it up. And it was just tight enough. I mean, it was just big enough for her to get sit in there with a little bit of room. So she had enough room to eat, and that was about it. I just locked her in that little container, left her in there, and came back 30, 45 minutes later, or something like that. Prey item was gone. But nine times out of ten, in my experience, you do something like that. You just seclude them in there with the prey item for a little while. Come back. They're going to eat it. If they don't eat it, take it out, feed it to your monitor lizard, and then try to offer them the next week. Now I want to show you guys what I got going on here for the big guys. I've got three rabbits set out. They've all been thawed. They've all been warmed. Been in this towel right here drying off. Um, and... They're between four and six pounds. Uh, they're going to my uh, two big retics and my berm back there. And I want to show you guys something because I see a lot of people talking about doing live feeding of their rabbit and so forth. Um, if you're squeamish about euthanizing a prey item uh, before you toss it in there to your animal, then rabbits are about as easy as it gets. And these rabbits are already dead. Like I said, I pulled them out of the freezer yesterday. But I want to show you guys how you do this if you've got a live rabbit and you need to euthanize it before you feed it to your animal. All you do, it's real easy. You'll get this animal up by the scruff of the neck and you kind of put the V of your neck, of your hand, right there at the base of its skull. And then all you've got to do is take your hand up underneath the jaw like that and rotate the head backwards just one quick motion and it's gonna separate it's gonna instantly euthanize that animal it's the most humane way to do it I know some people may be squeamish about doing that but I guarantee you it's much more humane to have that animal up instantly euthanize it and then give it to your animal if you're having a hard time getting them to eat frozen thought or you're having a hard time keeping it warm whatever the case may be much more humane to do that and then offer it than it is to throw that animal in there alive, risk it hurting your snake, risk it taking forever before the snake actually kills it and having that animal suffering unnecessarily. Uh, there's no reason for that. There, there's really not. Um, the only reason to feed live really is for your own entertainment and that's an entirely different discussion um, that somebody probably should have with you. Um, so we want to be feeding these guys, especially larger prey items, pre-killed or frozen thawed. And there's not too many justifications uh, for doing it any other way. So that being said, I want to show a couple different feeding techniques here. I've got three snakes to feed. And we're going to go ahead and start with Monty. And I'm going to show you the first technique, which consists of just opening up the door kicking it in there where you're out of the way. Now the bigger the prey item is, this may be a little bit harder to do with one hand. It's about a four pound rabbit and it still can be a little tough to hang on to. But what I'm doing with her right now is I'm just gonna open the enclosure on the opposite side that she's at. And I'm just gonna kinda hook the prey item in there. And see how she's right here. Prey item's right here. And the glass is between me and her. There we go. Come on, sweetie. And there you go. And you can just kind of close the door a little bit. And she's going to find that rabbit here in just a second. There you go. And then this is an opportunity too, while your snake's eating, to go in there, change the water. As soon as they eat, they're going to need to have fresh water because they will drink a lot. And especially if you've got a 14, 16 foot snake, they're going to go through a lot of water after they eat. 
But for right now, we're going to keep on feeding. And I'm going to do that after the video is over. So you can look down and you can see the way he's sitting in there. And I want to show you a situation that you're going to find yourself in at one point or another. There's going to be a time when you open the door and that snake comes out of the enclosure and gets a hold of the prey item and it gets a hold of it, it's outside. So what we're going to do is we're going to get his door opened up a little bit. Just enough for him to kind of get out because this is what I'm going to demonstrate to you guys. And I'm going to see if he wants to eat. Yep. There. Okay, well, <laughs> I didn't get him out far enough. But he's still hanging kind of out of the enclosure. So, once he's latched on, always be careful. If you've got a really temperamental snake, they will let go of that prey item sometime and defend himself if they're scared because this is a really vulnerable time for them. Oh, <clears throat> in the wild, this is a time when their only weapon, their mouth, is occupied. So, unless you've got a really good relationship with your snake, just be really careful when you move them. But one thing you can do is start by moving them by the prey item, like this. You start tugging it, that's going to make them lock down and pay attention to that prey item a little bit more. And then you can just put your hand on your body. Yeah, see how he started to let go for a second there? Yep. And let's get him in. Get him closed up. So I'm gonna feed my male berm while we're down here too. And he, he takes a lot of coaxing sometimes. He might be, he might be good to go to eat right now. Maybe he'll come out a little bit more. Just come in there, let him know that there's food there. There you go. Just making sure that, ah, <laughs> I was just making sure that the food was between him and me. And you probably heard it on the video there. He got a hold of the tongs. Instead of grabbing the head, he went up and grabbed it up top. So, and this is a good example of what you'll see sometimes. And you just get him moving. Right now, he's concerned about constricting that prey item. You can see, I get his tail right here. He should start wrapping me up. <laughs> but he's got that rabbit all wrapped up now. So there's one really important thing to keep in mind here too, uh, especially if you've got big snakes, 10 foot and over, 12 foot and over. Um, this is about the most dangerous time of owning these animals. Um, you know, we spend so much time socializing our animals, you know, learning how to let them know that we're just handling them, that they don't want to bite us. Well, when it comes time to feed, we're wanting that food response to be right there. And they're so instinctive when it comes to food, they will flail around, they will grab at stuff. You gotta really be on your toes and make sure that you've got somebody else around down there that can help you if you slip up somehow. Um, once that food drive gets kicked in, man, and they smell it and they, they pick up on that prey item, you know, just like with Apollo there, he ended up getting a hold of the tongs and everything. If I would have been holding that uh, rabbit with my hands, he would have got a hold of my hand and the rabbit. So use your equipment, stay on point, make sure you've got somebody else down there with you, and you'll have good experiences with them. So you saw the size prey item that I was feeding, you know, a single prey item. Roughly the girth of the snake, a little bit less in this case. Uh, the one in Monty had, you know, they elongate. You know, you may pull your rabbit out of the freezer and it looks like it's this big, along, big around until it thaws out and stretches out and it's only that big around. So that can be a little bit deceiving. That's another reason why I like to weigh all of my stuff and I write it on the uh, package before I throw it in the freezer. Um, just got my scale out there, weigh it, write it down, throw it in there. That way I can look and know where I'm gauging these animals at because they're gonna eat again in another two to four weeks. I try and space it out like that. I give myself that two week latitude based on how the snake looks. Now, Monty down here, she's 
she's a little bit thick. You know, she's not obese. She's still young. She's still growing. But she's a little bit thick. So I've got her stretched out to probably three to four weeks. My male over there, he's older. And he's, he's, a, he's a bigger snake already. So I stretch him out a little bit more. Um, he's right at the three or four week mark. And the berm, a berm's metabolism isn't quite as quick as a retics. Um, so they can take a little bit longer to digest. You know, you're going to start off with your hatchlings, feeding them every week. Uh, you know, once they get up eight to ten feet for mainland, probably somewhere in that. Um, you know, you can maybe bump them down to every two weeks, um, or or keep a keep a modest sized meal every week. I mean, some people will feed every week. Um, I know people that, regardless of the size of their snake. Um, they'll just give them a four pound meal every week and there's nothing wrong with that um, my my thoughts on that is that the snake's body goes through so many changes when it eats um, <clears throat> the heart the lungs all its organs expand uh, its whole physiology adapts to a meal when it when it gets something down in them and i personally think it's a little bit better to feed them give them time to digest and then give their digestive system a rest to where it's back to normal all its organs are back to normal and it's just being its typical athletic reticulated self um, so I space them out a little bit longer uh, and you definitely I guess I should probably point point this out too um, <clears throat> your snakes are going to grow you can manipulate their size by how much they eat but not in the way that a lot of people think you know just like me I'm, I'm genetically predisposed to be the height that i am and i can stop eating and shrink and get smaller or i can you know stick with the ice cream every night and keep the dad bod that i probably should start getting rid of uh, it's not going to change how tall i am it's going to change how much space I take up this way. And it's the same way with your snakes. You know, they're genetically predisposed to a certain body type. And overfeeding them is going to kill them a lot quicker than most things. You know, you'll hear about power feeding and just throwing food at your animal and throwing food at it because you want to see it hurry up and get big. Now, the first time you see a necropsy of an obese snake and see just how much fat is actually in that animal when people do that, um, it, it'll, it should change your tune really quick. Uh, reticulated pythons are supposed to be lean. They're supposed to be, you know, they're, they're semi-arboreal snakes. And you definitely don't want to be throwing food at them all the time. Um, you know, berms will get a little bit thicker. Anacondas will get a little bit thicker. Um, you know, and to keep that in perspective, you know, the, the longest snake species in the world is a reticulated python. The heaviest snake species in the world, which is not the longest, is the anaconda. Okay, so anacondas tend to be shorter than reticulated pythons, but always weigh more because their body's different. Um, you know, those are water-dwelling animal primarily, whereas reticulated pythons are more semi-arboreal. So that's going to tend to big to have big differences in their body shapes. So I am going to start stocking some pigs for these guys, kind of mix up their diet some, you know, throw them a rabbit every now and then, throw them a pig every now and then. Uh, these guys are so far beyond uh, jumbo breeder rats, it's not funny. You know, they can survive just chucking rats at them like Tic Tacs, but it's always better just to have an appropriately sized meal, give them something, they eat it, they digest it. And, you know, you're not constantly throwing these little meals at them. You can feed these guys multiple rats um, more frequently. Uh, I'm just a bigger fan of one appropriately sized meal um, and then space that out whatever the time is that's appropriate for, for the metabolism of that animal. So like I said, you're going to hear different techniques. Um, a lot of people have got... The own, their own system that they've worked out, their own way of doing things. Uh, there's multiple ways to do it, um, and there's multiple right ways to do it. So, you know, this is by no means an end-all, be-all. This is exactly what you got to do. It's just the rule of thumb that I found is 10 to 15% of the snake's body weight, um, and that's weekly for young snakes, moving up to bi-weekly as they get a couple years old, 
and then as they start getting larger 12 14 feet and up um, stretch them out two four weeks something like that um, and it's just really important that you don't overfeed them you don't underfeed them you don't use food to regulate their growth they're gonna be whatever their genetics dictates that they're gonna be um, we need to feed them appropriately and um, keep them healthy and whatever size they are is the size they are so so I hope that helped. Uh, if you guys got any questions, by all means, get down, drop them in the comments. Like the video, get it shared, get it out to more people. Uh, I've got several other videos to do in this series. And as soon as this series is done with the reticulated pythons, I'm moving on to our next series, which is going to be about Nile monitors. And that should be a lot of fun. You guys may see me get bit there. I'll have the uh, I'm Fine shirt with a big blood patch on there. Um, I got bit the other day. But it was uh, actually by my drone. It started raining and I was bringing it in too fast and it cut me on the chin. I would post a picture of it, but I'm afraid it'd get flagged for something. But uh, So yeah, the next series is going to be uh, Nile monitors. Um, we've still got a couple more things to talk about here with reticulated pythons. Um, husbandry, habitats, handling, socializing things of that nature we're going to hit every common topic on these guys a little bit at a time and like i said i want it to be so that by the time these series are done you know any animal that we've got a series about you can go in there if you're wondering how to feed it go in hit that video it'll give you an overview and there's always a lot more to learn you're not going to get it all in 10 or 15 minutes um, but it'll give you the key points and you know, there's other there's other things that we've got in the works too uh, that they'll go into a lot more detail on that stuff so so it'll give you a good healthy starting point and as always don't watch one video and take that as gospel this is exactly how you're supposed to do it take that one video weigh it against everybody else use your own brain and you know just as long as you're trying to do the right thing and you're doing the best with the information that you've got you know, find people that you trust to ask questions. And um, we'll continue to work together as a community to make sure that our animals are healthy, that we're doing the right things with them. And we're making the workload on US Arc as light as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And on that note, if you're not already subscribed to US Arc's YouTube channel or if you're not a member, those links are always in the description of all my videos. Make sure you get in there. Also, the end screen, if you missed the earlier videos in this, in this series, uh, I've got the playlist, and the next video will be in there when it's out. Don't forget to check out the video I'm also going to link in the description that talks about feeding Frozen Thought over live feeding. It's a 45-minute video, so make sure you get some popcorn, you get your coffee, and buckle in because I go into great detail about the reasons why I don't feed live. And I think they're pretty legitimate. So you guys have an outstanding day and we will see you next time on Intrepid Exotics.